this needle I actually call an antenna. It's part of what I call your energy system, like a fiber optic network. It's as thin as your hair, so I don't know if you can even see this guy. It's that thin. And I'll just arbitrarily pick a point on me and kind of go, boom. And you actually will see it kind of, it'll, it'll vibrate back and forth a little bit. And I can, I, for me personally, I can feel that like, all the way up to my head and mm. just, it releases. So all these points have different functions and names. But it's not some, like, mystery. See how it's shaking, man? Mm -hmm. It's not some mystery. It's a live human being thing. Joining me today is the legend Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob has been working in sports performance medicine for over 20 years with some of the top professional athletes and teams in the world. He specializes in oriental medicine, flow states, sports medicine, and energetic technologies. This is part one of a two-part flow, and I hope you guys enjoy. This episode is sponsored by MindSport, the number one meditation app for athletes. Hello and welcome to the Flow Station. I'm your host, Will Ferris, and joining me today is the legend of flow, Dr. Bob, the guy who showed me almost everything I know about flow and, and taking it easy. Uh, <laughs> appreciate you coming on. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, my man. Uh, we just had an elixir and a couple other things before this uh, get us tuned in. To create the free, free flow. There we go. You got it. So just to start it off, man, we talk about you almost every episode. You know, give a little background about what you do and your journey to get to your approach in medicine. So I've been in this uh, field for about uh, 24, 25 years. Um, my original start was way back in undergraduate school. I was looking at, like, what form of medicine or kind of get into what kind of help people. But I also was, like, a psychology major, biochemistry major, all these different majors. I really didn't find something that really, like, resonated with me so it's like part of a system like it's like well this drug tells you that this test is this and I'd always be like a test does not identify a human being and I, it always kind of like bugged me at a deeper deeper level so that kind of propelled me to understand about how people's health can be affected by just very simple things mm. so my journey into it got started um, probably my advisor at Whittier College great guy Dr. Uh, Clifford Morris blessings to him he passed away a few years ago awesome human being. Like he really, really cared. Before he was a teacher, he used to be a, a uh, Baptist minister. Hmm. So when he gave a lecture, man, this guy is like, got things up, bestowing, you know, like, hey, the, the rib over here, the whatever of the plant, you're just like, wow, <laughs> unreal. Tough, toughest test taker ever. He'd give you a, a blank page of paper. One, okay, um, Martians come to Earth. What, what part of the cell is that? Martians attack you. What, what does they shoot you with? He'd be like, what the heck? Because I must prepare you for medical school. Deep cat, but very, very uh, tuned into the deal. So we were talking about it. He's like, Robert, you know, what do you want to do? So he also offered a class in um, biology and songs. Hmm. So we'd listen to songs, and we'd, we'd write, like, things in biology. And it was amazing to me how when we listened to the songs, it just created, like, this easy flow state. And you'd be like, wow. And I kind of put these two together and kind of went, wow, well, the songs do that. What's it doing to our system? So we talked about that, and we figured out that this is probably back in, like, 1989 that brain waves were being changed by music you were doing. And plus, if you were in a creative process of learning, you could even be more creative. Hmm. So me and Dr. Morris sat down, and he goes, Robert. He goes, I don't think you're going to like the traditional medical school approach to things because you're all about life. That's all about death. And I go, what, what do you mean, Dr. Morris? He goes, people aren't coming to you to get better. They're just coming to you when they have an issue. And I mm -hmm. kind of went, well, does the system have to be that way? And he goes, well, he goes, why don't you go talk to some of my buddies? He's right for the MCAT. So I talked to like five or six different doctors. They're like, kid, don't do it. It's not like you think it's all about managed care. You're not going to help people. It's like, you, it's called crisis care. You get people when they have an issue, then you got to fix them. But then he, one of the doctors I saw said, hey, why don't you go see this old Chinese doctor? I go, Chinese doctor, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, no, no, very, very interesting. He goes, this guy was an orthopedic surgeon, had back pain for like 10 years, didn't have surgery, didn't do anything, which is very interesting. Went and saw this old acupuncture guy, and within five treatments, the pain was completely gone. So I go, see this gentleman, and the first thing he says to me, before I even say anything, he goes, in ancient China, the doctor would pay you if you got sick, but you had to listen to him. He goes, you heard me right. And I was kind of like, what's this guy talking about? Acupuncture, Chinese medicine? Like, I'm like, come on, man. So I took a course by him at a local um, community college that changed my life. He, he was talking about things that was kind of like 
poetic, but yet at the same time made a lot of common sense. Hmm. How you could help not only heal people, make them perform better, or assist them in a process of like, hey, your normal life, how can I take you from normal to like above normal, like super normal? So I kind of went, wow. So since I took that course, I've never worked a day in my life. I've been in a constant hobby. And a lot of people tell me I'm very unique in that way, but that's what I truly feel. So as you know me, I'm always learning something new or different, just having fun. I'm not like, you know, you know, my one joke, like, you know, strips, people come in and tell me about stress and I go, where's your stress, man? I don't see it. So that's a perception. That's a very, very interesting concept about that. But Dr. Morris got me started on this journey. And when I took that one course by the other doctor, it kind of gave me a kind of a different perspective and something I never even heard before. Most people have never even heard about it. Now they think, oh, it's kind of some weird stuff. They used to call me, I've had all kinds of nicknames like uh, Voodoo Bob or Magic <laughs> Bob and all this stuff because people would come in with weird situations and poof, it was gone. Mm. And I'd be like, no, that's the power of your body to heal itself. I'm just kind of tuning into that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and, we'll, and note, sense is common sense. Use your common senses. Most people don't use their common sense. They're just kind of in a hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, I've got to get through. And if you go too fast in life, you're going to miss the beauty of possibility. So with your hoop background and also just your, your wanting and your seeking to help other people in a way that makes sense to you, what were some so me, journeys, like a, a part of that? That's a deep one. So way. let me take that further back. So I was a very good high school basketball player, college. I kind of had some injuries and some weird coaches, so it wasn't as good as it could have been. However, my grandfather played for the Cleveland Browns back in the day. He also was a um, triple A pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals. And when, when I grew up, we had like six houses in a row, so uncles, aunts all throughout. Man. Mm-hmm. So my childhood was awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Until the fifth grade, then we moved away, and we were the first people to move. We moved to Michigan, and then we came back to Ohio, but a different spot. But being around my grandfather, and I had an uncle who was an all-American hurdler. He was 10 years old, like an older brother. I, I'm a pure gym rat. So you get me to gym, man, that's what I do. So I've always been around basketball, always been around that. But my grandfather kind of instilled me like, hey, sports is a fun thing to do, but also to push you to new levels of possibility. Because if you play sports, there's not a level of like, just an in in awareness of humans. Like if you play sports, your pain threshold is much, much, much higher. It's like, can you push through that? And once you do, it's kind of like, wow, mm. you're at a different level. You know, you've had great experiences when you play, you're just kind of like, wow, can we kind of like bottle this stuff up? It's just an awesome experience. So I always been around that when I was a little kid. So I always joke with people, I really haven't grown up. I'm not (laughs) not the same guy back then, man. I just have a lot more knowledge, maybe wisdom. But I always tell people that I'm 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 kind of like a a beginner. I know a lot of information, but I'm always kind of in wonderment about possibility. So I, I love to study situations and systems and kind of go, okay, how can we make this system better? And flow has been something that you've taught me in, in peak performance. And is that the reason why you've studied acupuncture more in a, a sports sense is because you feel like athletes have a better ability to tap into flow? Good question. So I was in acupuncture into medical school, medical school way back when. I studied all the acupuncture energy points into a sports context. So I would look at every point and I'd look at the historical background. Like, say this point had like 20 indications. I kind of created a matrix where I could go, this one key word, whatever that word might be, meant that it could help sports people. But my premise, though, wasn't like, oh, you had a bad ankle, you didn't have an issue. I can just help you perform better. So mm-hmm. it's like, say so this is your normal, I could take you up to here. So the biggest guinea pig for everything is myself. So I started working myself, playing in some hoop leagues. I'd be like 18 for 20. People would be like, dude, it's unreal. I'd be like, the basket was this big. Mm. But there were certain kind of points I'd work on myself that activated in me part of my brain with further research called the prefrontal cortex. It would actually kind of like turn down to actually go into another state. People all have, always had this state. Like one com- common example is like when you drive your car, let's say on a freeway, you're driving, and all of a sudden you're like, where'd 10 minutes go? Mm-hmm. Poof, you're in, you're in this state. But when you're playing sports, though, some of the characteristics might be time slows down, you see things differently, you're just kind of like tuned in. So mm-hmm. that's the kind of state I live in with, you know me, all the things that I do. I do like elixirs, which are kind of like Chinese herbs mixed with other substances that just kind of help this prefrontal cortex move things through your brain. Mm. And so what would you define flow 
in just an ordinary sense for people that are, are trying to tap into it? What do you what do you see preventing people from tapping into it? And, and what are some ways they can tap into it themselves? So I, w- I would describe, there's different ways to look at flow. So we could use like a general vernacular flow. Or we could use a science one. I'll go science first. The prefrontal cortex, part of your brain actually deactivates. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a Christmas tree. Part of this brain deactivates and then other parts activate. Mm-hmm. But you have to get to that. And that's what people have an issue with. So common flow states for people might be like, what are the hobbies you do? You know, I'll do this hobby, like I lost myself. Like a lot of women that crochet or do all that stuff, they're just, they do it and all of a sudden it's like, where'd the time go? I would not define flow though as a common expression of like, hey, why do you work out? I mean, I get rid of my stress. That is not flow. Mm. You are working out to get rid of what you perceive as stress. That is not it. Mm. That is not a flow state. You are doing something to clear something out. So I ask the question, okay, to be in a flow state, some characteristics, how is your breathing? So you hear a lot also people will do yoga. Man, I felt great in yoga class. Then I'm like, what happened? Well, I left yoga. Well, no, the yoga class is still with you. You forgot some of those concepts of breathing. Mm. So when you look at the brain, you can look at it like three systems. You have the medulla oblongata, deals with like your circulation, your heart rate, and your blood vessels. But if you can get a sense of that, like training a muscle, all of a sudden it's like, whoa. I'm free of that. Mm. You see a lot of people that are very, very hyper all the time. You'll you hear people that like tap their foot, adrenaline mm-hmm. based, mm-hmm. not in flow, but it's like maybe they're doing a deal or that's like how they are. They kind of get jazzed up, but you're actually losing vitality in that space. So it's like, a, think of like a gas tank, full tank of vitality, which is your energy. You start doing this, man, you pump it out. Then you want to have something, some substance to kind of go back. And then you're kind of in this bad system of like, losing energy you're not you're not kind of like in energy what i like to say is like when you're in flow you and time have a different relationship mm-hmm. it's almost like whoa like what happened there but you can sense it. it's almost like you go to like a a bottomness and it just gives out and if you haven't been in flow it's hard to describe it to somebody but it's there man yeah so is one of the prerequisites you think just making the action no matter if someone's making you do it or not make it feel like it's under your control under your freedom definitely but you can also look at flow so remember Scott, from a scientific point of view we can go to a common view is like you should have a task that you want to complete mm-hmm. and some skills that maybe you're working upon so say you're you know you're learning a new hobby or something so you're in it all of a sudden you have a breakthrough like wow this became easier mm-hmm that puts you in kind of a state but we can also say that just by being in nature might put you in a flow state mm-hmm I would say the opposite of that might be like you're in a cubicle working somewhere, you're doing all this, you're not in a flow state. Mm -hmm. You can look around and see how many of those people are actually smiling. Mm. Actually, by smiling, you secrete certain brain neurotransmitters that make you relax. Look how many people smile or don't smile. Most people are like, come on, man, smile. So that's an interesting topic. Like We've become a culture where most of the time we're just on our computer, we're on our phones by ourselves. Um, and we've been talking a lot about the dopamine versus serotonin in, in individuals and in corporations and groups. Um, how would you describe that, I, I guess, from a scientific and also common sense, again, dopamine versus serotonin? So from a scientific point of view, if you and I have a conversation here, we increase our serotonin. Mm-hmm. You'd always see that families, when they ate together or had maybe like a feast or a festivity or a festival, people are always happy. Now with this... I can talk to you or be connected with you, but I don't see you. So it disconnects me in some way. And then my brain is looking for another hit of that reply. That increases this dopamine in the body, which kind of like, it's almost like adrenaline. Oh, I got my hit. I got my hit. So if you're doing all these hits all the time, and again, technology not good nor bad, just part of a process. It's how you use it. This is way, way too much. You'll see people walking around that look like zombies. Mm -hmm. So I always ask the question, so Will, do we have more zombie shows on TV now? A lot more. You look back 15, 20 years ago, no zombie shows. Mm. Very, very, very interesting just that concept. So I talk about, like, this is like a non-human Wi-Fi. Mm. When you and I connect, we have a human Wi-Fi that bestows all these chemicals to us and makes us kind of, like, tuned in. We feel connected. Yeah. And as humans, we need to hug, touch, all that stuff. This, like, we're going to have, like, longer fingers when we get... I mean, as we, we supposedly maybe evolve. No, man, we don't need that. But it's, but it's a new thing. And it doesn't mean it's good nor it's bad. It's just how we use it. It's too early to tell. Yeah. But we have to kind of, I think, shift away from that and or maybe change the way that we educate people. We have more screens and we have more things that are kind of like you can quickly pick up like boom, 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 like a 
like a point. Boom, boom, boom. You get this. A point. Boom, boom, boom. Because most people's um, focus time or their concentration is way, way, way down because of that dopamine. And when you say that's part of flow is having your full attention on one task for more than just five seconds, check your phone, five seconds, check your phone, five seconds. Yeah, so I'll give you an example. Another, another state of flow for me, I'd be like doing research at night. Like I might find like I'm studying a certain neurotransmitter. I go into that neurotransmitter, but it's going to take me to different levels because it's going to link up that thought with this thought to that thought within this thought. It's just not me on the screen. Mm -hmm. That screen is giving me info I can then take in and then I can use it or chunk it the way I like or it's like a puzzle piece over here. Oh, now I see how this links. Mm -hmm. For me, it's always like flow should bestow some creativity to you. Yeah. We can also say flow is like there's different brain waves. You have a beta wave, which isn't flow. You're just kind of in natural awareness, concentration. When you go into a alpha, theta, that's like a flow state. When you can actually, I have a brain device where we can actually see people's brains change in real time. Mm -hmm. When they're in flow, people will be like, wow, that was awesome, man. So I also think flow is nourishing to people. We don't mm -hmm. talk about nourishing people in our society because everyone's in a hurry. A lot of people that I will work on a treat will always say, man, I feel so tired. Mm. And I go, no, you're not tired, you're relaxed. We can't even distinguish those two. Yeah. Uh, when, would you say like mental well-being is a prerequisite as well? Like not having being anxious, not being, you know, depressed to tap into flow to for, have certain states. For sure. States? If you have those other states, we might ask the question: Why do you have those? Mm -hmm. What is your baseline? How do we get you here? So, say this is our normal, normal. If you're down here with some issue, how do we get you through that? But anything that you have going on is an opportunity. We can ask the question: Why did that put you in that state? And if we get in that discussion, we can talk about that, and then we can get you through that state. I use the term not, K-N-O-T, like you're knotted up. Like, what's the not in your system? Because people always will talk about their issues. When people come and see me, they're like, oh, I got, I got this now. I go, hey, what's good about you today? Mm -hmm. People look at me like, what do you mean what's good with you? I wouldn't be here if I felt good. I said, no, no, no. You're talking maybe about 3% of what's wrong with you. You have 97% that's good, but you're talking about 3% is bad. It's taking you out, man. Mm -hmm. So I always try to flip the equation, but into people's consciousness about why it might be. Mm -hmm. So I call that common sense denominator. Take an issue as far back as you can that you're actually aware of and see where it goes to. But getting back into sports, though, so you work with people in sports, they know what flow is because they've been in it. So they'll be like, dude, like, wow, like, this is crazy, man. Because not only will you feel flow, you'll feel your body kind of, like, loosen up and you'll be like, like, wow, mm -hmm. which is a deep one. And, and so you talked about nourishing oneself what are some ways that people can nourish themselves so they can tap into flow more? And, you know, we always talk about an ounce of prevention over a pound of cure. Deep one. How, do, how does that tap into nourishment? So deep one is like, do you truly love yourself or like yourself? A lot of people don't like themselves. If you don't like themselves, laugh at yourself and start liking yourself. <laughs> Biggest thing to do. <laughs> people have a hard to, I mean, you'd be surprised how many people don't like themselves at a deep, deep, deep level or have somehow been kind of like um, slimed at some level not to like themselves. That's number one. Number two is... Can you get a breathing pattern and actually feel your breath? So let's just say, quote, a stressful event occurred. Okay, but if I'm in my breathing pattern, I'm just going to breathe right through it. So a lot of people in our society are upper thoracic breathers. They only breathe with half their lungs. Most people come to see me like, this is where I hold my stress. I say, no, this is where you don't hold it. This is where you don't breathe. Mm. So a simple technique might be I'll, I'll do it for the camera. Like, I'm just going to hold my right nostril, close my mouth, watch my body. I just got bigger, but that's an internal massage for myself, not an external massage. So a lot of a lot of society likes always to go external. Mm -hmm. It's not internal. It's always got to be out there. So there's some deep concepts of that where everything's external. Well, what about me? Well, no, I'm anxious about this. I'm anxious about that. Well, are you really anxious, or are those things kind of taken out? And people become hypersensitive. Yeah, kind of takes them out. Do you think that's more of an identification with something that's going on or something you're doing versus you actually as a human being? Hard to say. Each per so the unique thing about what I do, everyone's mm -hmm. unique. Mm -hmm. So you might, I'll get a call, hey, I have, make up a story, anxiety, I have headaches. I've never met your anxiety, your headaches. I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how you deal with it. So if, like, if you can kind of like follow that like a flow chart of some sort. Mm. If you just listen to people, they'll tell you what an issue might be or again my term of not be. You have to listen to people. And I tell people that come and see me, it's like, you're part of my family, man. I'm, when I'm working with people, I'm flowed in. I'm not like, hey, who's going to call me, whatever. No. Yeah. And truly for me, when I work with people, 
I get energy back in that serotonin thing because most people I treat will give you a big smile, man. Mm-hmm. There's no money you can put on a big smile for human to human. Yeah, it's a deep, that's deep. Or when you're working with a sports person, they'll, they'll give you that look like, dude, I always get like, this is crazy. And I'm like, no, man, you just don't know what it is. <laughs> because you feel this expansion in the body where you're just like, wow, like I didn't know I could move like this so easy. Yeah. Uh, and we, we tapped into meditation a lot. We, I mean, at least I, I asked you a bunch of questions about it. And yes. I think one thing that's been flowing through my mind is you talked about people not really loving themselves. Mm-hmm. and I guess or, like, or even liking themselves. Yeah. Let's just start with liking themselves yeah. first. We'll have to love later, man. <laughs> yeah. But just when, when, let's say someone identifies something in them that they want to fix or they, that they want to let go of, um, how, at what level is it self-reflection trying to figure out the root cause, that knot you were talking about versus – the meditative practice where we've discussed it's no judgment about anything. You're kind of letting things go and pass. And well, get, again, up. it depends. So you got to be with the person, individual person. And you kind of like, you'll hear people talk about maybe what the issue is. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I view anxiety like it's stuck energy. So you're thinking about something that you can't move through. It's just stuck there all the time. You're almost like, well, there it is again, there it is again. It's like, okay. So if we have that, how can you move your body differently? How can you breathe doesn't mean you don't need a medication, but it's like simple things like, you know, an elixir with blah, blah, blah on there or some magnesium on your feet can change issues. It's always like how do you – it's almost like if I drop like a little rock in the water, how does that ripple through someone to help them shift? Mm -hmm. But they have to take it personally. It's like we have to have a conversation where you are actually going to attempt these things. It's almost like if you're a really good coach, you're like, hey, working on my foul shoot form, and I'm just joking, but someone's shooting like this, and you're like – Okay, that's your form, right? And they're like, yeah, it's my form. And you're like, okay, well, let's bring the elbow in. Let's do this. And then they're like, wow, that feels a lot better. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people don't know because they don't know. Right. It's a deep concept, man. And once yeah. they know, they kind of go, wow, I can't believe how much better I feel. I say, no, 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 believe it. You really feel that way. Mm-hmm. It gets deep. Yeah, and we talk about rituals in, in, in the office a little bit and, and finding ways to find space in your day for you just to be a human being. Um, what are some insights that you have in terms of, of meditation? So let's look at it this way. How do you start? How do you end? So what do you do when you wake up? What is your ritual when you wake up? Mm. I'll, I'll do a breathing exercise. I usually listen to the same music every day. It gets me in a rhythm. A lot of people will be most creative when they're in the shower. Write those things down. Because once you get out of the shower, you forget those things, and the day starts and kind of takes you out. Mm. So always, always try to be creative. When you're creative, that's a flow state. It'll create a new wave in you, but, but trust it. Mm-hmm. Don't think about it. Feel it coming in. And once you have that, you're like, okay, I made my deal. What's going on? And then what do you eat? Like, do you have to eat like all the time? Once in a while, I'm on a super whatever diet today. Well, I'm kind of like, you can eat anything, man. It's just how does it affect you or what does it do for you? Mm-hmm. Are you eating it because you saw it on the internet? Are you eating it because you like it? There's different levels of that. Yeah. Um, and then we also tap in. I mean, you work with so many athletes. When I first came in, I was beat up probably 20 pounds heavier, just lifting weights all the time and just wasn't really transitioning onto the basketball court. Why so, though? So tell me why you did those things. <sighs> Man, just the way the system, the way I thought, you know, you had to overtrain to be better and keep going, going, going. When, you know, when I met you, you're telling me, hey, man, slow down, tap into some different movements, find ways to create space in your day. And I don't think I realized until too late, but when you find that <laughs> space in your day, you actually upgrade more than you would if you just kept training and beating yourself up. But how would you talk about overtraining versus uh, connective training? Well, I would say it like, you know, that old adage, you know, no pain, no gain. People mm-hmm. think we have to go over the edge. Remember we talked about athletes have like a different threshold. And again, in a game situation where you're training at somebody, you have to kind of like break through to become better. But a lot of people will just train really hard. And I call that adrenal training. You're just working like, oh, I had a good workout. Heart rate's up. Oh, man, I feel like I had a good workout. What would you really do? Did you work on skill? You just worked hard? I could have you go jump around in the forest and do stuff, chop wood, and you'd have the same workout. Mm. It doesn't mean that you got better. For me, it's like you should have like a routine of what – you should have a routine, and then what your routine is like, how are you getting better as you're training? Mm. Like, okay, I'm working on this skill set. I'm working on this. What am I trying to – it's like have a goal, get a goal. What am I trying to achieve? Mm-hmm. A lot of people just get out there and just run around. It's like, and then people have naturally more athleticism as you show through. But if you work on your skill, you get even better. Yeah, sure. And and one thing we were talking about yesterday was just the endless information that we're able to tap into now, especially with phones, internet. We can just tap into whatever. What what's a way that we can you know prevent ourselves from buying into this fast food 
information society that we now find ourselves in. That's that gets into a whole big story of other things too. So we have all this fast food, right? People mm-hmm. don't cook anymore. Look how many people are kind of out of weight or all these health issues that if you go back to the basics and cook your own food and do things, you're going to feel a lot better. There's so much information that you can gather on the internet that you become dopamine addicted where you're just addicted to info. Mm. But my thing is like people are like surface dwellers of info. They take it, they take it. Oh, I got more info. Info, but are you actually embodying the info? Are you actually doing something? So you kind of go deeper down. And my big thing is that you're unique. So someone's telling you info, is it your info or their info? Mm -hmm. I might take a bit of someone's info and go, hmm, I'll try this out myself. But then again, what am I trying out for? How's it it assisting me? A lot Mm. of people just are bored. They have to have a purpose. Like, what are you here to do? Get into your purpose, man. Have an adventure in your life. When you do that, man, things start to roll. Mm. A lot of people sit back and like, well, I'm doing this and this and that and and whatever. And I'm like, you're not living life, man. You're just sitting back and you're being fed information. So it's like once you take the reins of yourself and start doing things that you love to do, things will find you. A lot of people just sit back and they get trapped. Yeah, they get trapped in just the external things. What are some ways that people can find where their purpose is? People already know. What, what, what would you love to do you haven't done? People already know this. People ask me and tell me, like, you already know. You just don't do it. Mm. You have hits about things that you should do or you have an inkling about possibilities. Not that you're going out on a limb. It's like a fruit tree. Where's all the fruit out there, right? It's ripe. Go get it. Go mm. for it. But have adventure. You can't be fearful about stuff. A lot of people have fear in things. They're like, oh, my God. I'm like, Oh my gosh, to what? <laughs> Life is about having experiences. It's not about being fearful. But our society, our society teaches us many things to be fearful about, like watch out for this, watch out for that. And I'm like, really? Yeah, I mean, that's one thing you've taught me a lot is to be my own unique self and, and to kind of buff away, not good or bad from parents but or, or other mentors or other things and just be my own unique self and not just kind of like a copycat of whatever I've learned and, and heard about. Um, and, and we also talked about the rituals that other societies used to have and when people are going into adulthood where they became their own person. And now it just seems like we don't have that. Um, what, what's your take on that well, and, and some ways we can recreate that, that gets, in that gets society? Deep, that gets into some deep stuff, man, about what is our family unit? Um, are we connected as family people? You know, do you see your family? Uh, you, know, you become 21 now. People go out and drink and do whatever. And, oh, I had a ritual. I'm an adult now. Not really. Other societies used to have like a process you went through. For example, the Native Americans had a process to become a young adult, which I think is very important because it signifies, which is very interesting, going back to that flow state, there's something called your prefrontal cortex. It does not develop until you're 25. Mm. So people, I don't want to say this in a nice way, people still, there's a lot of marijuana and that stuff out there that will delay the prefrontal cortex from ever maturing ever maturing. If you do enough drugs, you're, you're out, man. It's not going to mature. So you got to be careful about that stuff. And parents don't really watch their kids enough. They just like, oh, well, see you away. And kids are doing stuff they shouldn't be doing because it's so available everywhere. Mm. And then these states pass these regulations where, listen, kids are taking this stuff and it's messing them up. Yeah. And throw in also all of the uh, screens that people have. People are da 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 People just do that stuff to kind of like slow down, but it's a false slowdown. It's really not assisting them. It's almost like I'm checking out. Mm. Man, where'd I go? Come back. Oh, I need some more of that stuff. You haven't cultivated yourself to be aware of what you're getting into. You're just doing something that takes you out. Mm. It's really not doing anything for you. When I studied in Japan, I got to show my guys here. When I studied in Japan, I studied <laughs> these blind guys. I was in Japan for six months and we studied acupuncture where they'd have me like, I'd be like blindfolded. Okay, close your eyes. Feel for the rotten apple on the skin. At first, you're like, what? Then all of a sudden, you'd be like, Wow, it feels like a rotten apple on the skin. And they'd feel for like, um, they'd say, feel for the cotton ball on the leaf. And you'd be like, wow. So I started, to, I started to like feel things that no one ever described before. But I'm actually feeling on someone's body. And whatever I'd feel, if there was like an energy point there, it would feel different. It would feel like, is, a, is it an active point or an alive point? Or was it kind of like it was a stuck point? And that deals with the endocannabinoid system or the system of acupuncture or also something in Japan called the meridian system. It's like once you activate it, people will feel the flow. Like you've had sessions, you're just kind of like, wow, like, well, what do I feel? Mm-hmm. People always tell me, it's, I'll come back in the room and be like, hey, yeah, I felt this stuff, man. I'm like, well, no, you felt you internally. People just don't slow down enough to, accept, to kind of experience that. But if we think way back, say 5,000 years, you had less stimuli around you. You were very, very tuned in to what was going on. So your sense of self was way heightened. Mm. 
And did you want to show the, the needles? For sure, the sure, sure, sure. So uh, most people have these misconceptions about acupuncture. They're like, oh, my gosh, these needles or whatever. So a traditional shot, you get a shot, you know, as a kid or something. It's a much bigger diameter needle, but you're also injecting something in the body. So that's the ejection. This needle I actually call an antenna. It's part of what I call your energy system, like a fiber optic network. It's as thin as your hair. So I don't know if you can even see this guy. Mm -hmm. It's that thin. And I'll just arbitrarily pick a point on me and kind of go, boom. And you actually will see it kind of, it'll, it'll vibrate back and forth a little bit. And I can, I, for me personally, I can feel that all the way up to my head and mm. just, it releases. So all these points have different functions and names. But it's not some, like, mystery. See how it's shaking, man? Mm -hmm. It's not some mystery. It's a live human being thing. It's a live interaction. And again, when I study all these points back in the day, all these points that correspond to sports, I'm going like, well, every person's a sports person because they always want the same thing. How can I be, how can I be happier? Mm. Yeah, man, I, I think what you do is so unique. And I think one of the coolest things is you've never really done anything like this where you try to put your name out there or, or try to try to go seek anything. It seems like everything comes to you, all the links. I'm not trying, I'm not like a marketer. I don't care. People just show up and have fun, man. I'm like, yeah. I'm like in a cave, but... I'm not like, you know, Dr. Bob's whatever circus. It's more like it's more like a connection like you're in the family and people that are in it really know what it is. But yeah. I also get the story that I treat a bunch of sports guys, high-level NFL and NBA guys, they won't share the info because it's like their secret weapon. I'm like, yeah, that's pretty interesting, man. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to part one of this Flow with Dr. Bob. If you enjoyed it, stay tuned for part two. Also, you can follow us on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, clips of these episodes please keep sharing with your friends and, and keep tuning in i wanted to give another quick shout out to my sponsor mindsport mindsport is a meditation app made specifically for athletes if you want to improve your performance on and off the court lower your stress levels learn the foundations of meditation and yoga and improve your quality of sleep this app is for you make sure to give it a download in the itunes app store and we'll see you in the next video